Welcome back to Bible Study. We are looking at the Bible readings for the 21st Sunday after Pentecost. And our Bible readings are from Isaiah 45, 1 through 7, Psalm 96, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1 through 10, and Matthew 22, verse 15 through 22. Let's uh, begin with our prayer. Sovereign God, raise your throne in our hearts. Created by you, let us live in your image. Created for you, let us act for your glory. Redeemed by you, let us give you what is yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I, I think there is a connection, I would say, there is between the readings for the most part. And it has to do with who is the true God, who is the one true God, and how do we honor our one true God. And that's a, I think it picks up throughout the different Bible readings we have, especially because of always related first and foremost to the gospel reading. What we start out with, our first Bible reading is from the Old Testament, from Isaiah, and uh, chapter 45, verses 1 through 7. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him, to strip kings of their robes, to open doors before him, and the gates shall not be closed. I will go before you and level the mountains. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I surname you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Beside me there is no God. I arm you, though you do not know me, so that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make wheel and create woe. I, the Lord, do all these things. So this is a very interesting Bible passage. And I think it, along with its emphasis on there is one God, one true God, which again connects to our gospel reading. I think, I think another connection is what was going on in the gospel reading in the setting is that Jesus is being challenged by different groups of Jewish leaders about his authority, about the recognition of Jesus as Messiah. And what we have in this passage in, in Isaiah is the word that in the Hebrew is the word for Messiah. And that is the Messiah is also one meaning chosen one or anointed one. So when our, our reading says, thus, the Lord, thus says the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus. So the word anointed is like the word for, in Hebrew, the word Messiah. So one who is anointed. Well, throughout the Old Testament, uh, there is an understanding that there were people who were chosen to serve God in a special way. And then a recognition of that being chosen, um, that being authorized to represent God in a special way or serve God in a special way was an anointing with oil. And then the kind of person who this would typically happen with is a prophet, someone to serve God as a prophet, a king, someone who is now going to serve as the king over Israel, or also perhaps a priest, one who would serve in God's holy temple in Jerusalem, so that that person to that special role would be anointed for that special kind of serving. Well, what's unique about this is the one who is 
being represented as God's chosen one, God's anointed one, is Cyrus, who is, who is an emperor of Persia. He was the head of the Persian Empire. The, this empire was, in a sense, uh, serving God, though, because by overtaking the Babylonians, uh, defeating the Babylonian Empire, the Babylonians were the ones who had taken many Jews out of Israel, brought them into Babylon, and so they had been away from their homeland, away from their roots, their heritage, where they belonged for decades. And now because God has uh, strengthened Cyrus and his armies, uh, he has put Cyrus in a position to be a deliverer, um, in a sense a redeemer, or even uh, in the, the, one, the way we think of a Messiah as it came to be understood, more than just one who was anointed, but the one who would help redeem, deliver, uh, set free, liberate, uh, a, a liberator, and all of those kind of assumptions or understanding of what a Messiah is and who a Messiah is that evolved even beyond what any actual earthly person ever was to, to the point where uh, we come to understand that Jesus is the only one who could possibly fulfill that, that whole expectation. But in this moment of history, there is a real human being who, who, who was Cyrus, the emperor of Persia, who used his own forces to defeat the Babylonians and then said, okay, all of you who have been in exile, captive in a foreign land, you can go back and even um, designated certain Jews uh, to be leaders in the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the renewal of their, of their identity. Now, never a full uh, independent kingdom, but at least very, very supportive. It's really quite amazing when, when you think about it. Now, th again, the message from the prophet Isaiah is that God is clearly the one who is helping this all happen. God is really directing Cyrus, even if Cyrus isn't aware of it at the time, uh, for the sake of God's people, where it says uh, in verse 4, For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel my chosen, I call you by your name, meaning calling Cyrus. I surname you, though you do not know me. However, in the midst of this, as much as the purpose um, Cyrus has a special purpose. I think it was not only to be done without ever him being aware, because we are also told in verse 3, I will give you the treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places, so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. So that there was within this uh, God designating Cyrus to serve, on behalf of God's people, to, to liberate God's people, but also that this one would come to know God. Now, we, we don't really know uh, what, whether Cyrus really did come to recognize God, uh, but I, liked, I like to hope so. I like to think that there was a real possibility that that uh, also did come to happen. And... Um, yeah, we, we, though I will say the people from that era, most of the other nations besides Israel, uh, they tended to be very open to other different gods. Uh, but the one thing about the kind of religion of the Persians is they did kind of believe in a more a supreme God. So perhaps there was a little bit of a window for him to be open to coming to know uh, the one true God. Well, at any rate, uh, that's, that's the connection, though. The emphasis is, you know, who is the one true God? And this is the thing that Isaiah is definitely lifting up. And it's a good thing for us to be reminded of that. Now, the psalm also, I think, uh, kind of, to me, part of what the psalm is about is also about uh, recognizing, lifting up the sovereignty of God. Uh, again, that sort, that type of emphasis on who who is the one true God over over all all the earth, and so we pick up from 
the whole, the entire Psalm 96. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be revered above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord is king. The world is firmly established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. So uh, this is a psalm, and as you were hearing it read out loud, maybe uh, something kind of rang a bell for you and that maybe if you ever heard, have seen, have worshiped in, wish, yeah, worshiped in person at Christ the Servant or worshiped with us online, because there is a song that Pastor Dave wrote that is completely based on this psalm. And if you were uh, hearing that song by Pastor Dave, you would realize that he did very much uh, use this psalm as the foundation um, you know, maybe subtly adjusting the words, but, but many times the phrasing is very much just exactly like what we just read. And it's, it's a psalm of praise of God who is coming to judge the earth, but yet it's, it's also looked upon not in a sense of fear. You know, so often when we hear that God is going to be, you know, judging all of the earth, all of peoples, all of the creation, there's uh, that by the time of later in Judaism and also in early Christianity and as part of our Christian uh, New Testament Bible readings, uh, we, we get, there's a sort of apprehension sometimes expressed in that. But as God's own people, we don't have to have that apprehension. And that's what I like so much about Psalm 96, even though it is talking about, you know, God is the only, again, God is the only one who can judge all of creation, all of the whole earth. Uh, God is the one who made it all. God is the one who is over all peoples too, not just all of, all of the earth, but all, all of the peoples. And that does mention other gods, but it's very, very clear that, as it says, they are, that they are idols. You know, the Jewish people recognized that their neighbors did have other gods, but it was always then understood, but there was, uh, those were idols, those were false gods. It took a while, much later, for the understanding to come that those gods didn't even exist at all. Uh, but earlier in the days, it was more about, well, who do we listen to? Who do we follow? And sometimes when we hear about other gods and idols, uh, we, we might think, well, I don't, I don't worship any idols, I don't worship other gods, but that can still be whatever it might be that distracts us from fully listening to God, uh, from giving our entire hearts and lives to God, letting our lives be directed by God. And it's, it's any of us can do that, fall into that distraction, that, that kind of trap. So we're not, even though we believe in God and we know our God, we're not immune from that kind of uh, listening to the lure of maybe it's money, maybe it's power, uh, maybe it's status of, above others. Uh, there, there are things as humans that 
tempt us away from having God be the first and always number one in our lives. So that's where the psalm maybe does perhaps challenge us a little, but I overall love that it is completely with very much a sense of joy and praise that we can look upon God as the one who is over all uh, and that it's a judgment that we can actually anticipate with joy and not with worry or concern. So that's another nod towards, again, God is our one true God. And again, a very, very positive, positive perspective about that and the truth of that. Well, when we get to the, our new, uh, new letter, part of the New Testament, uh, we haven't been in Thessalonians yet. Uh, throughout most of the summer, we had a lot of reading in uh, from Romans. Romans is a very long letter that Paul wrote. And then we had Philippians, which is not a long letter. Uh, Thessalonians is a little bit longer even than Philippians. But what's so unique and special about Thessalonians is that it was, it is the very first writing of Christian writing that we have. So of everything that's in the New Testament, it is actually the oldest. I know this might be a little confusing because of course the Gospels talk about Jesus' life, which did come first, uh, of course, but those were not written till a little bit later. So the Gospel of Mark was written probably around the year 60, and then, um, the, then came Matthew and Luke, and then Gospel of John was, was probably written towards the end of the, very, of the first century, so it came along the latest. But this letter uh, by Paul is probably from around 45 uh, AD, so it's acknowledged usually as the very earliest uh, Christian writing that we have. And we do, uh, we do think that it was out of the time of around Paul's second missionary journey. So he'd been out on his first tour of uh, going into different communities and sharing the good news about Jesus Christ. And so then after he's been these places, uh, along with Silas, who was a partner of him in, those, um, in that mission work, uh, then he would write back to communities, Christian communities that he helped establish. And what we get in this, uh, in this sense that uh, also besides Paul, there was a connection with other, other leaders, other early Christian leaders. Now, Timothy, you may have, you might've heard of Timothy. Sylvanus, we don't, we don't honestly know very much about him. I mean, he's mentioned a bit and it's clear that he was also one of these early uh, church missionaries, but also Timothy was someone who definitely, uh, we know, worked alongside with Paul. So that's the roots of this. Uh, that's a little bit of background of the, the letters to the Thessalonians. And there is there are two of them, by the way. And there's 1 Thessalonians and the second. But we'll start out, and this is the very beginning of 1 Thessalonians. And so that's uh, chapter 1 and verses 1 through Seven. I'm pretty sure. Let me make sure that that's the portion that we are definitely reading today. And uh, yes, that's it. One through seven. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction just as you know what kind of persons we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for in spite of persecution, 
you receive the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Achaia. So this is, uh, again, a word, a, a message of affirmation. Uh, one of the things that was, oh, you know what? I did, I, I stopped too soon. We were supposed to go through verse 10, so I need to pick up a few more verses. So that for the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. So that, that's, uh, that was important, those few more verses, because it, it also has that connection back to, you know, the one true God, so that you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. So that's, uh, that's a, quite an open, that's the beginning of a letter. And something that is uh, very typical of the style of letter writing in that day is that you would, uh, after the little like from who to whom, a uh, little blessing grace to you, then uh, a message about being thankful. And Paul, uh, I, I, I keep saying Paul, to be fair, this is a message from Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy together who express that great sense of faith that there is a way that this community has so strongly embraced the message of Jesus Christ and truly been guided, strengthened by the Holy Spirit, that this is something that has really, really taken root. And yet it's not been easy. Uh, there is There are challenges. Be coming from being a Gentile, not a Jew, and they had their own ways, their own culture, their own own expectations in the community. And as part of that would have been worship of a variety of gods. That would have just been, you know, to, to everybody then, that would have been so, so normal. And so then to separate from some of those norms of the community and not participate perhaps in feasts and other things that before that would have been just what you would do that would make them look strange to their neighbors, even to their own family members. And so that could make life difficult sometimes. And so staying faithful to Jesus, always looking to Jesus, that's what Paul says, look at you. Look how well you have done in this. Uh, staying strong, holding strong in your faith. And one of the things that uh, I do like, I appreciate, to always giving thanks and always praying for them. That's one of the things as Christians we should always continue to do for one another. Uh, think about how we're thankful for others that we know in our own growth as Christians and also lifting others up in prayer. And then hopefully in the same time, others are doing that for us. That's, that's a very meaningful, important thing that we continue uh, just like from the very, very, very early days of the Christian church. What I do also uh, pops out to me in the first few verses of this passage is one of the things, the way he uh, talks about praying for them and always remembering before our God and Father, your work of faith, your labor of love, and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't know, but maybe that did also catch your ear. It's not faith, hope, faith, hope, and love. It's faith, love, and hope. So the order of those three uh, key words is a little different. But there are other places and other passages and other letters of Paul where he, he, he likes to keep those three connected. Uh, the order might switch around a little bit, but he tends to bring in those three. And here it's faith, love, and hope. There is the better known passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which is 
uh, well known as the chapter on love that Paul shares. And that he also shares towards the end of that, uh, and these three abide, faith, hope, and love, these three abide, but the greatest of these is love. So in that case, uh, this was, that was something that was written later on in Paul's ministry. He, he puts love as the, as, the, as the final part of that trilogy. But here, uh, he ends with hope. And I think that might matter because in this context, again, he's talking to a people who were facing some, uh, some persecution. I don't think it was a deep persecution, but still um, a challenge to living out their lives as Christians. So holding on to hope in Jesus Christ was going to matter a lot. It would help them to, to, keep, to keep going. But what I like that, um, t he's thankful for their belonging to God, their work of faith, which is a way of saying that, you know, faith is something that comes in our believing in God and our trusting in God, but it's not just something that's just inside us. It's something that ends up being lived out also for the sake of others. So when it says the work of faith, it's, it's like your faith is lived. It comes into your life. It's not just something that just rolls around only inside of us. It makes a difference in how we live and how we treat other people, uh, how we help other people, serve other people. And loving, uh, of course, love as Christians is essential and core. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and then love your neighbor as yourself. So love is always, always gonna be central to who we are as Christians. And then again, that hope our hope is absolutely in our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he is the one who holds our future, and of that we can be confident and secure. He also, uh, the part of what's also is being reminded that God chose you. Um, you are beloved. You are you belong to God. You belong to God's family. And again, the work of the Holy Spirit. I, I really appreciate that Paul highlights that. Uh, we're not on our own in living out this faith in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is in us, with us, inspiring, strengthening, allowing us to live out our faith as he talks about. But one of the things I also really, really like of what Paul emphasizes is how in their acceptance of Jesus Christ and also being strengthened by the Holy Spirit, living out their faith, that they've become an example to other uh, Christian communities in their area. And that's really something to ponder is, I, I hope and I believe that together as Christians, we can be that kind of good, positive witness how do we live together as a community in a way that lifts up others, uh, shows, caring, uh, shows caring into our community, like we do things like having a blood drive, uh, collecting and giving food through Lutheran Social Services, uh, adopting people for Christmas. I mean, there's, there's a wide variety in the ways that we also, I hope, can be others can point and say, "Wow, look at look at the good that that has happened through those who are Christ the servant." Or wherever you are, how however you might end up being a good example of following Christ wherever we are in our lives, and I appreciate that. the The final word in this passage does who rescues you from the wrath that is to come. Um, there was a strong expectation, again, this was very, very early in Christian, in Christian church history, and there was a strong sense that Jesus was going to be returning very soon. It's called apocalyptic, and there will be some more of that as we go on further into Thessalonians. Uh, the return of Jesus Christ is something we hold on to, it's something we still believe in, uh, but I also want to say, not with anxiety, I think hopefully with that same perspective that we see represented in uh, Psalm 96, that that expectation of judgment, uh, really actually looking upon that as a very, very good thing, something that we can anticipate uh, in, in a positive way. Well, now we uh, turn to our gospel reading for today. 
and that is, uh, we, this has been a continuation. We, where we've been reading in Matthew, it's been uh, several weeks of sequence, portions of the Bible reading, one after another, one right after another. And so this, this bit we pick up here today is uh, immediately after what we heard from last week, for instance, which was the parable of the wedding banquet. In that, uh, what had been recently, Jesus had been encountering people who were leaders of the temple. And so certain Jewish leaders were challenging his authority. Again, uh, questioning could he, you know, whether he could possibly be actually sent by God, uh, one who represents God, one who may even be the Messiah. So those temple leaders had already had um, some kind of bit head to head with Jesus. Now, uh, a different group, it's actually a combination of more than one Jewish group that comes to also now challenge Jesus. So these are still some Jewish leaders who are challenging Jesus, but a little bit different group of Jewish leaders who are challenging Jesus. And we pick up in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 15 through 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciple to him along with Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one. For you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why? Are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this, and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. And they left him and went away. So uh, again, some, some of the things in the Gospels we hear in more than one Gospel. This is another one of those uh, things that shows up in more than one place. And again, different Jewish leaders were trying to challenge Jesus, trying to make him look bad in front of the, kind, the people because he, he was, uh, the number of followers of Jesus was growing. Uh, his, his popularity, I guess you could say, to a certain extent was growing. And so these leaders were feeling probably much more threatened by that, about what was happening with Jesus. And so they were trying to knock him down. That's really what they were trying to do. And so, uh, again, some of the temple leaders had already tried to do that with Jesus, but they weren't particularly successful. Now some other different Jewish leaders come to again try to uh, knock Jesus down a peg or two and that's uh, two of those groups. Now in Matthew's Gospel um, the Pharisees are never uh, come come through in, in a very positive light. That's not to say that all Pharisees were always forever against Jesus and Jesus' own day. Uh, we know in other parts of the Gospels that there were people who had Jesus over to their house that were Pharisees. They had invited him to share a meal with them and even to listen to Jesus. Nicodemus, who is told of in the Gospel of John, took time to go visit Jesus, although he did go at night, so he was being kind of, you know, like, don't let anybody see me go talking to Jesus, but he did go and he really wanted to learn from Jesus and he did become a, a follower of Jesus. So there were Pharisees who definitely were followers of Jesus. However, this, this is a group of certain Pharisees who are those who don't like what they see that Jesus is doing, uh, what he might have, how he might have challenged their authority. And that's, then there's the other group that's mentioned is the Herodians. And they were those who were more uh, supportive of King Herod. That might kind of make sense based on that name, the Herodians. 
Uh, but the, then because they were supporters of King Herod, that meant that uh, Herod wasn't always very popular with all the people. Uh, so it was more about a pow keeping power for them. And also because the Romans were in authority, it meant being much more um, cooperative with the Romans, which again, in general, the Jewish people at that time weren't, that's not what most people wanted. And also they were very much more open to Greek culture, uh, being, you know, being more sophisticated, more like the Greeks. And again, the Pharisees would not have uh, looked positively on that. So there were some pretty strong differences between the Herodians and the Pharisees. However, they both were in agreement that they didn't like Jesus. So that's why they could come together and uh, again, try to, try to set a trap for Jesus, try to set him up in a way that uh, he would look bad in front of people or he might get in trouble with the Roman authority. So their question, the, the trap that they lay is they, they ask him a question that is pretty much, uh, there's no way you can answer that you don't uh, get in trouble with somebody. So they say, uh, with this question, tell us then, is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? Now, is it lawful, uh, as far as the Pharisees were concerned, lawful, not in the sense of uh, like your laws governing your society, but the laws that come from the scripture, from, from, from God's word. That's the kind of law that they were talking about. On the other hand, you could also look at it at the broader society and say, you know, is it, is it you know, are you keeping the law when you pay taxes? And of course, where we live now, yeah, you keep the law, public law, when you pay your taxes. Uh, so it's a question too, though. It is, it's a real setup because nobody likes paying taxes ever. It doesn't matter when in history we're talking about. It. Nobody, nobody's happy about that. However, um, they are also putting Jesus in a real bind because if he says, no, don't pay taxes to Rome, if he says you, that's against God's law, then there is a problem there because uh, the, the Herodians who have more connection with the Roman leaders could say, hey, this Jesus, he's telling people to not pay tax to Rome. And so that could get Jesus in trouble more quickly with the Roman leaders. But then if he says that you should pay the tax to Rome, well, again, like who, nobody likes taxes. So right, right away that makes Jesus unpopular with the people who are becoming his supporters. <laughs> so that would have not been good in that regard. So again, it seems like how there's no answer that Jesus could give that it wouldn't cause trouble for him in one way or another. But Jesus is very, very wise because he says, well, and he did this already before he would answer whatever question or challenge they were giving him, he kind of would come up with a question first. And so then he says, well, because they asked him, is it, is, it, is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? And then he says, you can tell they're just trying to be sneaky. But then he says, show me the coin used for the tax. So to pay the tax to Rome, uh, it had to be in a certain Roman coin. And that happened to be what is called a, denari a denarius. That's the coin that would be used to pay the Roman tax. And that, that's just history. So then, uh, then he says, we'll, sh we'll look at this coin. Um, let's look at that coin. Whose head, uh, what, are, what are the words written on it? And even to this day, you know, if you pull out your coins, you're going to see, in our case, you're going to see the head of a former president, basically. And then there's also going to be some words written on it. Okay, so long ago, people did the same thing. Who was the head of your government? And in that case, though, they did the, the, the current one. Uh, so not the long ago leaders like ours are. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, so they had the current Caesar, Tiberius. His head, his image was on there. But it's, it's not only that his, his image, the current human uh, head of the Roman Empire, 
had his face on that coin, but it was what was written that was actually really something else when, you, when we realized what was going on. And what was basically being written there was that um, something along the lines of this uh, is the son of the divine Caesar Augustus. So Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. And Caesar Augustus was the first Caesar, and he had been declared divine by the Roman Senate. A god. He had been declared a god. This human emperor of Rome had been declared a god. And Tiberius being called a son of God. In other words, a false god, an idol. And so here these Jewish leaders were showing in the temple, they're still at the temple, and they're showing a false god, bringing a false god into the temple. Uh, terribly wrong on their part, and I don't know if they even thought twice about that. So then Jesus kind of turns it, again, turns it back on them, and he says, well, whose image is on the coin? The, the image, you give that back to the one whose image is on it. You can... It, they made it, you can give it back to them. So I think that was a pretty smart way to answer. But then he goes on, and I think this is really important because he adds to that. That technically answered the question they asked. But he says, and you give to God the things that are God's. Well, okay, this is, it's still kind of mysterious. You know, I don't know if we'll 100% know exactly what Jesus was saying, but I do think because he's in the temple and just like we heard in the, in the psalm, uh, God, who is the creator of all, over every creature, over all the earth, over all the universe, uh, Genesis 1, talking about creation, tells us that we, human beings, are created in the image of God. And so, along with the kind of message of something like Psalm 96, and then Genesis chapter one, that you and I bear the image of the one true living God. So just like the coin had the image of the emperor, it belongs to that emperor. We have the image of God. We belong to God. And give to things that are God's, that's your whole self. And also God is the God of all creation. So pretty much nothing is outside of God's realm. Sure, a Roman emperor, he's got a certain territory he, he oversees. He has certain funds that are from his treasury. But God is over all. Uh, there's nothing that is outside God's realm, God's authority. But we have a wonderful and good God and that is something to always remember and that we also are to be the reflection of our God in our, in our life, wherever we are. So I think what Jesus gave was a very excellent and uplifting, ultimately, and powerful message in his response to this trap that was set before him by these particular leaders. So I hope, uh, keep that thought with you. Being the image of the one true God, how we reflect God to others so that they might be just like the Thessalonians, a positive light to others in their community. We'll share in our Lord's Prayer together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into salvation, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lead us not into temptation because we are already saved. And may you have a very blessed week.